Honey, come on over here, sugar buns. Don't talk about testicles in your mouth. That's really disgusting. This machine just called me an asshole. <laughs> Welcome to Castle Rock Radio. I am Max Booth. And I am Lori Michelle. And this is the Stephen King Podcast. But not today. Today is the Richard Bachman Podcast. Oh, shit. So what should we call this episode? What should we call the show, then? It's not Castle Rock Radio. I don't know. Uh, what's an anagram of Castle Rock Radio? Uh, you're asking Quick. me to do an anagram without having a piece of paper in front of me? Come on, now. Are you really searching for Castle Rock anagrams? Anagram. Oh my god. Did you mean Nanaram? No, I didn't mean Nanaram. <laughs> Google, now's not the time for jokes. We're live. <laughs> Castle Rock Radio. Castle Rock Raw, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's just try Castle Rock. Um, we could do the Cockwolds. We could do um, Crack It. Crack It's Radio. Hell yeah. Um, we could do the Cockwolds. <laughs> That's okay. Um, we could do Seacock Radio. There you go. Welcome to Seacock Radio, everybody. <laughs> this is the Richard Bachman podcast. <laughs> Today on the show, we're talking about Richard Bachman. Are we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you sure? He's known for creating the infamous Seacock Univils. <laughs> <laughs> How many uh, fictional giants, such as um, hmm, Robert black and white um the awesome kids club from that book that <laughs> that <laughs> yeah richard bachman's that it was about these kids who uh they meet this clown and they just go on these awesome adventures was it quarter wise yes <laughs> i don't think so and about half, like, till the end of the book, they, uh, all the kids randomly, while they're in the sewer, they all get naked and they play Dungeons and Dragons. Well, that's the way you're supposed to play Dungeons and Dragons. You're supposed to be naked. Didn't you know anything? I never played Dungeons and Dragons clothed or otherwise. Well, now you know. Now you know you should be nude. But we're not talking about Richard Bachman's that today. <laughs> we're just talking about him in as, general. as a man. As a man, as an image, as an idol. That's the dark half of Stephen King. Oh, oh. boy. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I guess we're going to do the intro right now. Yay. So, listen to this. All right, now... You may be noticing something different. You can actually heal us now without holding your cell phone directly to your face. That'd be crazy. There's a, there's a good reason for that. We have fixed our microphone issue. We know we've been quiet in the past. If you were just quiet people. And we've tried. We've tried everything to make us sound louder. And now, on episode 10, we've we've cracked the case. We've... Well, loud now. Do you want to explain how we solved this issue? Yeah, you went into system preferences and turned up the microphone. Who would have thought about doing that? I did. I, I didn't. <laughs> no. I looked online. I googled the issue. I asked. I asked Jeeves. He he did not know. I, I didn't know the, Jeeves was still around. Yeah, it, I had to travel. Oh, I see. To India. He uh, what? To no, India? he he lives in Maine. Oh, okay. He lives in Seacock. <laughs> Seacock, Maine. Seacock, Maine. Yeah, I had a I had a drive down this long road. He's retired. He lives like on this hill in this tiny cabin type of thing. And he has an old dog named Bob, and the Bob's like half dead. And Jeeves, he he sits on the pillow trying to swing with um a bottle of root beer and a, a shotgun. Have you been on Pirates of the Caribbean lately? And you have to like <laughs> you have to like answer all these riddles he has. But they're really easy, like what's black and white and red all over. It's like, dude, we know this. A zebra who travels the world. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, I asked him. He said, I don't know what the microphone is. So he was, he was no help. But we, we, we fixed the issue. Hooray. 
we went into system preferences and we uh, raised the value on the microphone and now we have sound hooray (laughs) (laughs) so yeah going on mold you should be able to heal us i wish we could go back and fix the last nine episodes but there's no way to do it so you'll stuck with those well not impossible to listen to just they're kind of quiet maybe slightly inconvenient Meh. Maybe. But yeah, today we're talking about Richard Bachman, despite the last episode when we promised we would be talking about The Mist. Yeah, we'll get to The Mist. It's okay, you have not missed The Mist episode. (laughs) It will be coming probably next episode. We just haven't had time to watch any TV or read anything. So today we're going to be talking about Richard Bachman of Seacock fame. And this is Seacock Radio. Let us tell you a bit about Richard Bachman. <clears throat> he uh, he was born in New York. Awesome. He um, did a brief stint in the Coast Guard, which was followed with 10 yields in, as a merchant marine. Very exciting. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty uh, amendable. That's like a manly man's job. Bachman eventually settled down in uh, New Hampshire, where he ran a medium-sized dilly film, and he would write at night. His fifth novel... Um, was dedicated to his wife, Claudia Inez Bachman, who I don't know if she also wrote, but maybe. She took this photograph that's on the back cover of the novel. Yeah, that's cool. So that's important. But they, a photo was never posted of Bachman until his fifth novel, which was out, which was the one dedicated to his wife, and that was Thinnel. Um, some little fact about Rachel Bachman. He... Had they had one child, a boy, but he died when he was six years old. He fell into a well and drowned. Aww, that's really sad. It is sad. You think any of his books were all about a boy who fell into a well and drowned? I haven't read all of them. I don't know. I can't hmm. answer that question. Maybe he had some old books in the future about boys who drown in wells. Maybe. Maybe it's called Well, Well, Well. <laughs> Maybe it's called Well, actually, a well. <laughs> <laughs> um, in 1982, a brain tumor was discovered near the base of Bachman's brain, but it was successfully removed. Amazing. Yeah. Sadly, Richard Bachman died in 1985. You want to know what he died of? Oh, God, he died? He died. He died of cancer of the pseudonym, a rare form of schizonomia. What the fuck is that? I don't know. I'm afraid of getting cancer of the pseudonym. Wait a minute. Hold the phone. Are you telling me Rachel Bachman was a pseudonym? No. For who? (gasps) I don't know. Quick. What podcast are we doing? Seacock Radio. (laughs) Wait. Hold on a second. That's an anagram. Is Seacock an anagram? It is. Wait. Could it be? It could. See, is Richard Bachman Dean Koontz? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, wait. That doesn't make any He wrote sense. even Stephen. Oh wait, no. <laughs> Stalin Shia LaBeouf. LaBeouf. I yes. just spit on your breast. <laughs> Quit spitting on me. <laughs> <laughs> but no, Richard Bachman is a pseudonym for Stephen King. Woo! What? Crazy, crazy. Beginning in. Oh, man, 1977, Richard Bachman, I mean Stephen King, began publishing books as Richard Bachman. Yes. What? Crazy, who, huh? who, who knew this? Is this public knowledge? Yes. I'm only just now finding out. Uh-huh. Sure you are. Oh, my God. <laughs> Breaking news. <laughs> are you dying in Super Mario Brothers? <laughs> no, I've got cancer <laughs> of the pseudonym. <laughs> Oh my god. Really? Yes. This is how you tell me? Yes. Live on Seacock Radio? Yes. <laughs> so, so, I mean, when was his, when did he, when did Stephen King begin publishing? He started publishing in 74 is when Carrie came out. And then Rage, which is Bachman's debut novel, came out in 77. So right. that's what, three years? Three years. He didn't wait too long to begin going with Bachman. No, he didn't. I mean,. I think the reason, basically, why he began going as Bachman is because he just had so many goddamn books at once, and publishing the way it is, they didn't want to release all of them that fast, so to kind of 
gets null of a mouthfeel without having to wait so long. He just made up a pseudonym. But yeah, I mean, he lasted 77. He came out with Rage. 79, he came out with lo- The Long Walk, which is probably the best thing he's written. Right. I think The Rage was like the first book he wrote. Oh, before Carrie, even then yeah. it just wasn't published till afterwards? And Ra- Rage was pretty controversial, co- controversial as well. I mean, yeah. it's about a kid who holds his classroom hostage. It's kind of like a fucked up breakfast club because they kind of talk about the feelings and they become friends. However, Rage, you can't even buy that shit anymore because in 1997 there was a school shooting in Kentucky and the kid who did the shooting, well, they found a copy of Rage in his locker and King himself, and Bachman, I assume, requested the publisher allow the book out of print because he didn't want it right. to inspire anybody else. I mean, shit. Bachman. Well, it's sad that... I'm, I mean, it's kind of a prolific thing, unfortunately, and then I don't know if Rage inspired it, or if it was I, just... I don't think a book inspired something I like that. I don't think so. I don't... If we begin claiming books and movies inspired someone to go kill somebody, then... Right. Where will we go from there? Exactly. No. You know, I could see why it would be a touchy subject, and I could see why he would want the book removed from publication. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I understand. It's just... Obviously, that's not the only school shooting that there has been. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> and after the long walk, in 81, we had a uh, Road Walk. I haven't read that. Um, 82, Running Man, which was, of course, made into a movie right. with uh, the governor of California. The He's, ex-governor. The ex-governor. Now who is it? Um, Polly Shaw? Uh, probably. Squeeze, squeeze <laughs> the juice, buddy. <laughs> Don't do that any better than that, please, because that would scare me. <laughs> Um, in 84, he released Thinnel, mm-hmm. and that was the book that outed him as Bachman. So he lasted from 77 to 84 without being caught. Pretty amazing. Oh, shit, wait. Uh, so the microphone isn't plugged in. <laughs> what the hell? It's, uh, shit. Okay, now it's plugged in, so. So now it should sound okay. The last 10 minutes or so. It's probably going to be loud, like we promised, but it might be... Might be fuzzy loud. Enough. Might be a bit fuzzy, but it should be good now. I had unplugged it to test that it was actually playing loud, because for some reason, when my microphone is plugged into the laptop, the audio won't play on, on the garage band. So I have to unplug it to listen to it. And I guess I forgot to plug it back in. But now we should be fine. God damn it. I hate technology. Hooray, technology. Well, it's not even technology. It's just me. <laughs> Not you paying went, attention to things. You and technology. God damn it. <laughs> what will we be talking about? I don't know. Seacock oh. Radio. <laughs> that we, he had lasted from 77 to 84 without being caught. Yeah, so you went through Rage, Lawn Walk, Road Walk, The Runny Man, and Thinnel. Very exciting. Which was also made into a movie, and it was terrible. It wasn't the worst movie I've ever seen, but it was pretty bad. Anyway, he was outed in 84, and then nothing well, because well, he died in 85, so... He died in 85, and uh, when did the the doll calf come out? You know, I'm not sure. Now we have... Now we're looking at that. Hold on. Hold on. God damn it. Hold on. Okay, so in 89, the doll calf came out, and that was written by Stephen King, but it was also dedicated to Bachman. It was Stephen King's attempt of killing him. Makes sense. Because, as as we all know, constant listen olds, constant read olds. The doll cap is about a man with a pseudonym slash split personality, correct? It was his. It was his twin. It was his twin. Oh yes, yeah, I remember it was, that. He was born with a twin in his head. Yes, an unassimilated twin. And uh, in case you haven't told, can't tell that was one of my more favorite Stephen King. Uh, it's been so long since I read it, but I, I remember at the end like they battle in some type of. Yeah, I don't remember how. To... Lake house. Yeah, I don't know. We need to do an episode on it. We will, because I like that book. Yeah. Yay. Do we even have a copy of that? Yes, we do. Is it all bright? Is half of it bright? No, it's all dark. <laughs> har, har, har. But, good old Bachman, he wasn't done with ill. Even though he died in 85, he had many trunk novels written. <laughs> Just like V.C. Andrews. Yeah. Only good. <laughs> I have to imagine on the trunk, it, 
engraved that said Seacock. <laughs> Only in your hands. Was that the name of a horse, Seacock? No, that's Sea Biscuit. <laughs> oh, <laughs> good old Seacock. <laughs> But yes, in 1996, he came out with a truly awful book called oh the uh, the Regulators. I hated that book. Which is a goddamn stay tuned because we have to do an episode on that because it's so bad. I, I, I read Desperation it, first and then read The Regulators. That's how you're supposed to read them. I, I hated it because I love Desperation. It's and supposed I to be like what? I'm, like a middle Im- image uh, yeah, of Desperation? Supposed, yeah, and I just I couldn't see The Regulators it. is hilarious. Uh, I hated that book so bad. <laughs> I remember in the beginning, some kid's just riding his bike down the street, and his uh, van just comes up to shack and then blows him away. Yeah, it's the somehow best book. somebody's held hostage yeah tack 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 yeah, i don't know i just <laughs> didn't like that book we should do both episodes back to back we could and the regulators episode and the regulators episode we'll talk backwards I don't think I can talk backwards. Well, maybe we can do some garage band editing and make it just all run and backwards. Slow <laughs> but but he wasn't done yet. Oh. I'm trying to do some math. Eleven years later, <laughs> <laughs> he came out with one last book called Blaze. Have you read Blades? I can't say that I have. I read it when it came out. I liked it a lot. But it might be a bad book now that I think about it. It's basically inspired by the... Ah, who was that rich baby who got kidnapped? Oh, the Linda Le- baby? Yeah, it's about this mm, mentally slow man who kidnaps a baby from a rich family and they bond. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's called Blaze. Alrighty. But what's funny about Blaze is the other night at, at the hotel... I was watching a Stephen King interview on YouTube because that's what I do to relax. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> this one was from 93 when he was in D- um, D.C. talking, giving the speech. And he was talking about how after his debut novel came out, he had two other novels already finished. Um, one was called Second Coming, which would later go on to become Salem's Lot. Okay. And this other um, suspense novel about a kidnapping. He doesn't. He doesn't name it. Right. But he says it's about a kidnapping. It's a crime suspense novel. Obviously, he's talking about Blaze. Right. But then he decided to. He decided to go at Salem's lot. He uh, he sent both books to his agent and well, his editor. I don't know. Both, and he I asked knows. him to help him decide which book to go with. And they went with Second Coming, which was Salem's lot. But then he says how wait like a decade passes. And he gets out Blaze, the second book. Right, the other book. From his desk, and he reads it again, and he says, and this is in 93, how he is so glad they went with Salem's Lot because his second book was such a piece of shit. (laughs) And he he goes on again in 93 to say how no one's ever going to read it. He will never allow it to be released. Fast forward to 2007, look what's out, Blaze. Well, he could have rewritten it then. I'm, I'm, then, I'm you know? sure he did. I'm sure it's been rewritten. But I just, yeah. it made me laugh. Right. It made me chuckle. Did you go, ha, ha, ha. I laughed my seacock off. <laughs> <laughs> At the hotel? Who else? <laughs> <clears throat> but, um, yeah. What else am I talking about? Um. Well, how oh yeah, it says right here on Wikipedia. Phillips Publication King rewrote, edited, and updated Blaze. Very exciting. So we definitely have to do that one. Um, in the Dark Tower books, there's a children's book inside the series called Charlie's the Charlie the Choo Choo. Right. And it's kind of a fucked up children's book. I don't know what book it comes into. I think The Wastelands. We'll get to that one. But, uh... <clears throat> the book is written by Claudia Y. Inez Bachman. It's a throwback. Throwback. A throwback. <laughs> um, and then, of course, in Sons of Anarchy, there was an episode where King cameoed as a man who did contract work quietly disposing of deceased bodies, and his name was Bachman. Very exciting. Ha 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 ha. Uh, yeah. So that's Richard Bachman. What we're going to do today is we're going to go over the investigative Washington Post article that originally 
broke the news of who Bachman really was. Because it's kind of interesting. I mean, how many people have read that, really? Right. It was published in 87, I think. No, 85. April 9th, 1985 is when a Washington Post article was revealed. Published. Revealed. Revealed. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Stupid internet. No. Look what the internet has done to you. <laughs> but before we read that, the, um, the guy who... Um, who wrote the article, his name is Steve Brown. Everybody we talk to talk about on this show is named Steve. I mean, the guy who did the, the quiz book was named Steven Spignesi, right. and now we're talking about Steve Brown, who uncovered Stephen King. What the hell? Is everybody <laughs> named Steve? It's the Steve conspiracy. Speaking of Steve, what's today? It's Stephen we, King. It's TV S- King Day. Stevie King Day. And Stevie King, as uh, constant listeners know, I love saying that, <laughs> uh, Frequent guest Betty Rocksteady, who wrote Like Jagged Teeth. She has a cat named Stevie King. And today, on July 16th, the comic Heathcliff in his Sunday Kitty Kernel featured Betty Rocksteady's cat. Cats. That's very exciting. Stevie King Day. It's the best day. Best day ever. But yeah, back to um, Steve Brown. Who is not a cat, as far as we know. <laughs> Maybe. He but we have not cat. seen an image of him, so. It's possible he could be a cat. Cats are stealthy. Is Steve Brown a cat? That would be our next investigative journalism. <laughs> <laughs> Breaking news Steve Brown is not a cat. <laughs> <laughs> I think Steve Brown probably knows he's not a cat. And... Okay, so. <clears throat> this article is called Bachman Exposed. This is not the Washington Post one, this is something he published on a website called it's Le- Lila's library Leha's library I know I- I've heard of this website before because they do all sorts of Stephen King giveaways and they always have Stephen Grave King giveaways 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 yes grave that's aways. awesome <laughs> giveaways and they always have like all the latest news and like if you're ever looking for anything like weird or unusual chances are they have it and, or they know where to get it they sell things? I don't know if she sells things or... Do they have a just... DVD copy of Maximum Overdrive? They, they, you know, she might. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so do you want to go ahead and read this I thing he's can. posted? All right. Okay, so Steve Brown writes, When I read an advanced copy of Thinner, I was no more than two pages into it when I said, This is either Stephen King or the world's best imitator. I began to ponder that maybe this was King, more or less as a kind of game, not real seriously. I took the subway over to the Library of Congress to look up the copyright documents. All but the oldest were copyrighted in Kirby Macaulay's name, a big clue, as KM was King's agent, but not conclusive, of course. Macaulay had many clients. I almost gave up at this point, as the oldest book was copyrighted before the LC changed to an easy computer system. But just to be anal about it, I insisted the clerk go off and manually hunt up the document. She came back and handed it to me. There it was, Stephen King, Bangor, Maine. I Xeroxed all documents and went home. I mean, that's got to take a hell of a lot of effort to go to the Library of Congress to look all that shit up, oh, <laughs> especially when it's not on a computer. You'd have to be really, really invested in wanting to do something like that. He was invested, or he just had nothing to do. Maybe he had nothing to Maybe do. Maybe he had, like, a fight with his wife. He's like, I don't want to go home. Maybe she accused him of being a cat. <laughs> <laughs> All you do is lick your genitals. <laughs> what? That's what cats do, right? They lick little paws. Yeah, well, I don't know. <laughs> they lick all over. Goddamn Steven is licking. <laughs> so he goes on to say, I admire and respect King. I had no desire to do something that might hurt him. So I made copies of everything and wrote out a letter explaining my research. I told him I'd love to write some little article about this, but that if there was some sort of problem involved to let me know and I would promise to keep quiet. I mailed the package to King, care of Kirby Macaulay. I expected at most some little note in return. Two weeks went by. Then I heard a page over the intercom at the big bookstore I worked in. Steve Brown, call for Steve Brown on line five. I picked it up and a voice said, Steve Brown, this is Steve King. Can you imagine? Hey, Steve, it's Steve. (laughs) Meow. (laughs) Steve, you (laughs) can't. All right, you know I'm Bachman. I know I'm Bachman. What are we going to do about it? Let's talk. It hadn't occurred to me that he'd call, so I hadn't bothered to give him my number or even the name of the bookstore. He had spent a whole afternoon calling every bookstore in D.C. trying to find me. 
Jesus Christ. Zero so games. apparently he had nothing else to do either. Do you think he did that or he had like an assistant? Do I would it? assume he would have something <laughs> else do it because he's got he, other he shit to do. He made his sons do it. <laughs> Hero and look up these phone numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Because, I mean, well, how did he do that? I mean, he had to get, like, a Yellow Pages from D.C.? Well, pro- yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. God damn. He's... I mean, do you think he was freaking out? I don't, I don't know if I he, think he was freaking out. I think he was, I think he was I think, about it. I think at that point he probably was okay with people finding out. And... Anyway, we chatted for a while, and he gave me his unlisted home phone and told me to call him in the evening. Okay. <laughs> Let me just get Stephen King's phone number right here now. Oh, everything's cool. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Let's call him up on Castle on Seacock Radio. Of course. You think he'd be a guest? It'd be awesome. It would be awesome. I don't think he would like us. Probably not. Because if he listened to any episode, <laughs> it would like... be Gwendy's Button Box, <laughs> and he would not like that episode. Either that or he'd agree and go, yeah, this thing is a piece of shit. <laughs> I didn't even read it. <laughs> I just put my name on it and said, yeah, sure, go for it. <laughs> my new name is James Paddleson. I'm a cat. <laughs> So Steve ran out that night and got a tape recorder with a telephone attachment, and I interviewed him, meaning Stephen King, for three nights straight over the phone. He was very relaxed and very funny throughout. He didn't seem upset that I had found him out. He was extremely gracious and said that he wouldn't talk to anyone else but me outside of simply admitting it, that mine would be the only lengthy interview on the subject. It took a while for me to get it in shape and find a publisher. During this time... King kept it in con- kept in contact and told me that more and more people had read Thinner and were coming after him. Finally, I published it in the Washington Post. From there, it went everywhere. I stressed there was never any hint of blackmail. That King talked me talked to me of his own free will and gave me a lengthy interview at his suggestion, not mine. I think he knew that the truth was going to come out anyway, and he liked the de- idea of this nobody book clerk in Washington getting the story instead of the New York Times or something. I should also stress that I did all this out of simple respect for the man and because to me it was a wild, weird, and kind of cool game. I did not cash in at all. King mentioned me by name in the intro of the original edition of the Bachman books, but this has vanished in the current edition. So I was kind of, I, you know, King knew that he was done for. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm so, surprised he lasted that long. Yeah, me too. I'm going to try that shit now with the internet. Hell no. No, man. Mm-hmm. We're going to find out before you even get published. Exactly. What are you looking for? I was just looking at the first couple pages of Thinnel because he was like, I was able to tell within two pages it was Stephen King. No, well, he's got kind of a distinctive writing style, so. Uh, does he make fun of any fat people? Well, this whole entire book is about <laughs> fat people. Hello. <laughs> you think you can see his feet? <laughs> oh, no. Sentence one. I oh, cannot see my feet. I am a cat. <laughs> <laughs> meow <laughs> meow meow i think i'm not close enough okay don't run over my feet mm. so yeah that was the uh, introduction to the washington post thing i like that he wasn't even a journalist just some book guy. Some, some dude who realized it mm. so uh, so we have to talk about the headline of this washington post okay article it's the the title is stephen king shining through However, Stephen is spelled S T E V E N. It's spelled wrong. Did you not notice that? I I hadn't even really looked at it. To what be the with you. fuck is going on with this? What the hell, Washington Post? This is a fucking investigative report about the identity of Stephen King. They misspell his name in the headline. Yeah, no shit. <sighs> They spelled it correctly in the article. Yeah, but thank not... God. Well, yeah, you would think the the headline would be spelled correctly, especially in the Washington Post, the which is the P button was broken that day. Yeah, they're like, fuck it, <laughs> just put a V in there. <laughs> I mean, how? Why? Yeah. What is wrong with you? Hi, Chihuahua. Ha. Uh, but yeah, so Stephen King, Shining Through by Stephen P. Brown. They've spelled his name right. Unless his name is spelled with a V. And they put a PH in there. Maybe they just switched it. Maybe. They took Stephen King's PH and gave it to someone else. <laughs> Watch your PH. So I guess we're going to read the the Washington I Post. I can read the oh, Washington Post. The, the original one from <clears throat> April 9th to 1985. Very exciting. So, okay. Okay, so article. Novelist... <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. You have to say this dramatically. 
I, I can only be so dramatic. I'll do it. I'll do this one. Novelist Richard Bachman died of exposure early this year. Dun, dun, dun! <laughs> Meow! <laughs> I helped kill him. My involvement began when I read Bachman's five novels. Gradually, it dawned on me that they could have been written only by one man, and it wasn't Richard Bachman. It had to be Stephen King. The self-described literary equivalent of a Big Mac and a side of fries who'd become one of America's most popular living writers. What the fuck does that mean? I'm not sure. Big Mac's all disgusting. Uh, maybe in 1985, they are delicious. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. <laughs> My suspicions drove me to the Library of Congress for a look at Richard Bachman's copyrights. All but one were in the name of Kirby Macaulay, who is King's agent. But the earliest of the Bachman books rage when it's in King's own name. I sent him a letter detailing what I had found and waited for a dissembling reply. Instead, one day the phone rang. Steve Brown, this is Steve King. Okay, you know I'm Bachman. I know I'm Bachman. What are we going to do about it? Let's talk. The birth of Richard Bachman was much less dramatic than his death. Rage, a paperback, was published in 1977 by New American Library and achieved obscurity almost immediately. But ba- but by Bachman's fifth book, Thinner, that's really <laughs> difficult to say. Bachman was a chicken. But by Bachman's fifth book, Thinner, published right. in hardback Wait, last November, yes. Rolling. When we say Bachman, we have to say it like a chicken. Bachman! Yeah. So from now on, every time you say it, it's Bachman. I don't know if I can do that without laughing. by his fifth book thinner published in hardback last november a much bigger audience was beginning to form the book now stands at number three on the new york times bestseller list and number six on the washington post before thinner says king is that how king sounds i I don't know no do a different voice i can't do a different voice for king i'm a female (laughs) (laughs) the box (laughs) Books for dropping down a well. If I get 50 or 60 fan letters a week, more if there's a movie or the paperback of something out. Bachman was right. Bachman <laughs> was getting two letters a month. I never thought much about working and keeping Bachman a secret. What? Keeping what a secret? <laughs> Shut up. Stop it. <laughs> I didn't have to, but when Thinner came out, it was like carrying your grocery ho- groceries home and a shopping bag in the rain. Gradually, the bag softens and begins to tear. Things start falling out. Gradually, word began to leak out from a number of places. King was besieged by reporters, fans, and booksellers. I ducked calls from Good Morning America, King says. My hometown paper has been on the case. Some big bug at Walden's, B. Dalton, one of the chains called NAL, and said, Look, we think he's King. If you tell us, we won't advertise it or anything, but we'll order another 30,000 copies. But NAL kept saying no. He's not him. That's a confusing sentence. He's not him. Talk about pronoun confusion. ABC News and Entertainment Tonight have been bugging me every other day for the past two months. All of a sudden, it began to pop up all over. It wasn't just from you. It was from everywhere all at once. I'll keep denying it for a while, but I'm not in the same league as G. Gordon Liddy. The beleaguered king released the basic information to his hometown paper, the Bangor Daily News, in February. From there, the story spread until Thinner's first appearance, March 3rd, on the bestseller list. NAL immediately shifted, shipped flyers to the bookseller stating Stephen King writing as Richard Bachman. That's it? Bachman! <laughs> <laughs> Plans are being made for a one-volume reissue of the four out-of-print paperbacks. King is reluctantly allowing this to happen, but he is sensitive about the career of his spectral twin. Because Stephen King didn't need Bachman for the money, he needed him to get his books published. King throws off novels like Sparks from a Grinding Wheel. He is spiritually kin to the great pulp writers of the century's beginning, writers like Edgar Rice Burroughs, who turned out novels with the regularity of the lunar cycle. Can you imagine writing a, like a book a month? Yes. You can? I can imagine it. I have an imagination. Oh, okay. It's the follow-through, right? I'm imagining it right now. And how does that feel? Exhausting. I, I would imagine. But the sheer size of King's audience has put him into conflict with one of the paradoxes of modern publishing. The more popular he becomes, the less frequently his publishers are willing to publish him. Publishers have a superstition about publishing more than one book a year from a single author, says Kirby McCauley, Stephen King's agent. There are very few best-selling writers who write more than one book a year, and few of them have as much quality in their books as Steve does. 
He doesn't need the money anymore, but he loves to write. Well, he could share the money with me. Yeah, I'll take some of that. Yeah. I'll be talking to uh, newspaper clipping from 85. Yes. It's not listening. Oh, damn. Think about, I mean, if in 85 he had enough money, what does he have now? He has no money for everybody. I know. He could start, you know, he could help fund our bookstore. I don't know. He donates a lot. I know he does. To like libraries and stuff. I know he and his wife are very charitable. Yeah. So anyway. How much do those season tickets cost for the Boston Red Sox? I really don't know how much Boston Red Sox season tickets are. You know damn well he's going to all those games. Probably. King's readers couldn't care less about the niceties of publishing. They just want more King. I know how they feel, Size King. It's something that has nagged at me constantly throughout my career. I was aware eight years ago that the production of my fiction was out of control. I'm also aware that publishers are reluctant to publish more than one or two books a year, and I've always been three or four books ahead. I've been feeling the frustration of having this stuff pile up for a long time. Right now, I'm in the process of constructing a deal. In either 86 or 87, I'm going to publish four novels, all under my own name. They're not just going to sit around anymore. I am waiting against a tide of editors and publishers shaking their heads saying, no, you can't do that. Well, why can't I do that, I say? There'll be a glut on the market. You'll cut the sales legs from under the books. If there was going to be a glut in the market, it would have been the year that the five movies came out. The critics were all laughing about it. The Stephen King movie of the month. And all those paperback tie-ins. Then Pet Cemetery came out. The hardback sales of that book doubled anything I had before. Wait, let's... 86 to 87. Let's, let's look at that up. I don't know, because I don't know what books... I mean, what movies were came out in 86, not, 87. Not movies, books. What are you talking about? Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know. He said in 86 to 87, he was going to release full books. Full books. books. Well, the Drawing of Three is one of them. Okay, yeah. So, It in 86. Mm-hmm. The Eyes of the Dragon in 87. Misery in 87. And then um, Tommy Knockers in 87. So, he was probably talking about It. Could it probably be. came out at the end of the year. It could be. Yeah, well, that, then they see it, it says that Drawing 3 came out in 87, too. Oh, shit, yeah. So, the Drawing of the Three. So, and he did have quite a bit. Oh, the good yield to be king. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't even, I didn't mean to say that. But, hey. Well, why not? <laughs> Only on Seacock Radio. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back to the, back the, the article. So, in 1977, Stephen King begat Richard Bachman. What? I know, Richard Bachman! <laughs> <laughs> During Bachman's eight-year career, King and the very few people who knew his true identity kept the secret. For years prior to the publication of Thinner, King fended off the occasional query with a story that Richard Bachman was a New York, New Hampshire chicken farmer. I thought he was a dairy farmer. Wikipedia, you fucking wild. <laughs> a man whose cancer-ravaged face made it impossible for him to meet or talk with anyone. The poor guy was one ugly son of a bitch, says King. Doesn't he say that about the dark half? Doesn't he use that line? Uh, something like that. Probably. Then. King was, of course, already a household name. Brian De Palma's film of Carrie was out with Sissy Spacek's performance pushing the movie into national consciousness and the name of Stephen King along with it. That year, the paperback of Salem's Lot had gone straight to the top of the bestseller lists and The Shining had just come out in hardcover. King had already completed the first drafts of novels that wouldn't see print for years to come. Books like The Dead Zone, Cujo, and Firestarter. Oh my god, how frustrating is that? What, to have all those books and not be able yeah. to get them published? Yeah. I mean, shit, I finished a book in February and I'm I, I'm losing my patience that no one, that it hasn't been picked up yet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just wait a few years. Maybe you'll be Stephen King. Maybe I will. It'd be and nice. I could uh, invent a pseudonym. What would your pseudonym be? I don't know. What do you think it should be? Backsmooth? Hmm. Yes. <laughs> no one would ever catch on. <laughs> no one would ever catch on to Backsmooth. <laughs> <laughs> King decided he had to do something with getting it on one of those completed novels he was Whoa. fond of. What the hell is getting it on? <laughs> I want to get it on. <laughs> um, uh, shit, it's probably Rage. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It was different from his usual work, and he was afraid it would become a book the parade had passed. He had contacted editor Elaine Coster at New American Library, King's paperback publisher from the beginning. Coster and NAL gr- agreed to publish book under assumed name. I was empathetic about not wanting the book to be publicized, King said. I just wanted it to go out there and either find an audience or just disappear quietly. The idea was not to just publish a book that I thought I felt very strongly the difference between selling commercially and selling because I loved what I was doing. 
I allowed the Bachmans to be published because I felt that nobody was going to get cheated. I thought that the books were very much alive, and that's not true of everything in my trunk. Stephen King was good, but to honestly try to create another name that wouldn't be associated with my name. It was like having a Swiss bank account. The manuscript for Getting It On circulated around NAL's editorial offices under the name Guy Pillsbury, King's grandfather. But it leaked out that Pillsbury was Stephen King. King withdrew, retitled, and quickly resubmitted the manuscript as Rage. Okay, yeah, I was right. You were getting it on. Getting it on. I Jesus don't think anybody Christ. would. I think that would have been a good erotica title. <laughs> getting it on. People would have read that and they would have been, what? Getting it on uh, by Richard Bachman. Bachman. <laughs> <laughs> then they called me up, King says. They asked me what name I wanted on it. There was a Richard Stark book on my desk and the Bachman Turner Overdrive on the stereo. So I told them to call him Richard Bachman. In the ensuing eight years, NAL published three other Bachman paperbacks, The Long Walk, Road Work, and The Running Man. Hardly anyone noticed, until thinner. In 1982, King finished a new supernatural thriller. It ran 300 pages, fairly short when compared to, with a 500-page reader-saturated novels he's known for. That same year, Richard Bachman's fourth novel, The Running Man, was published. That was the last of the original four pre-Carrie books. Oh, damn, so you read all of them. Before Carrie, yeah. But there were many other books waiting to be published under King's name, so he decided to make Thinner a Bachman novel. It was the beginning of the end for Richard Bachman's career. Thinner was too obviously a Stephen King novel. Well, yeah, I mean, the rest of them, there's no, like, supernatural elements in it, but this one, yeah. Right. A, a gypsy in it. Well, and probably by that point in time, his voice was becoming more steadily his voice, whereas the other ones he had written before, you know? Yeah. So, therefore, he was still looking for who he was. Who am I? Who am I? I'm Richard Bachman. <laughs> <laughs> Published in hardcover with heavy advertising, it lacked the anonymity of the previous four books paperback publication. There was even an enthusiastic letter sent to booksellers by editor Coster. As the publisher of some of the finest horror novels ever written, it takes a lot to get me excited about a new horror writer. Such a writer has now appeared. Woohoo! I've been put under a lot of pressure for a long time, says King. NAL wanted me to come on over and do NAL hardcovers, which I had been reluctant to do, but I thought Thinner is a strong book. It's not like the other Bachmans. It's more like a Stephen King novel, and it has a chance to be commercial. I asked NAL if they wanted to do this book in hardcover, and they were very enthusiastic. People at NAL who didn't know who the hell Bachman was, was were enthusiastic. They pushed it hard, partially, I think, because they wanted to show me what they could do with a hardcover. I originally went to New American Library full-time because they published the Bachman books. It was through the Bachman books that I actually got to know people over there, real people. I was able to go to Doubleday and negotiate with the sure knowledge that if they passed on the deal I was offering them, that I would be able to go to NAL as Stephen King because they'd been so good to my friend Richard Bachman. Doubleday was King's first hardcover publisher, and more recently his novels have been published by Viking Press. Of course, this was back in the 80s, so... Yeah, I think, who knows who published <laughs> Yeah, I'm not now. sure. King is famous or infamous, depending on which critic you listen to, for his use of the brand name Detrius of modern culture. Throughout his work, he invokes the names of the most familiar household products to deepen the intense realism of his best fiction. In a wry acknowledgement of his own omnipresence in our daily lives, King uses his own brand name in Thinner. You were, you were starting to sound like a Stephen King novel for a while there. Oh, I bet he fucking chuckled about that one. Oh, I'm sure he did. <laughs> That's me! Ha ha ha! I'll never know! Uh, the New American Library managed to keep Richard Bachman's identity secret for eight years. was a remarkable feat, considering the intense scrutiny Stephen King's every utterance is given by his legions of fans. I wanted to jump up and down and say, This is Stephen King, Elaine Costa remembers, but I couldn't. We had many questions over the years, but we never let anyone to believe that it was Steve. We just stonewalled it, even though it would be to our advantage not to. It became a mission for me to respect Steve's privacy. We were so secretive that our chief executive officer, Bob DeForio, didn't even know. One piece of subterfuge was the placement of the stranger's picture on Thinner's dust jacket. The face, staring at the reader with amused detachment, is that of Richard Manuel, an old friend of Kirby McCauley's. Manuel lives in Roseville, Minnesota, a St. Paul suburb, where he works as a builder of energy-efficient homes. I didn't tell anybody, said Manuel. I was sworn to secrecy. Some friends called and said, hey, Dick, there's a guy that looks like you who's writing books in New Hampshire. 
<laughs> Even my sister called and said that. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah. Macaulay said he and King picked Manuel because we had to find somebody who lived a long way from New York. There would have been a chance that someone in New York would recognize Richard Bachman walking down the street. I think the Bachman, Bachman. Bachman. I think the Bachman books are pretty lively, King says. I felt very ambul- ambivalent about my life and my writing at the time, partly because I went to college, which is never really a good thing for guys like me. I felt very strongly the difference between selling commercially and selling because I loved what I was doing. I allowed the Bachmans to be published because I felt that nobody was going to get cheated. I thought that the books were very much alive, and that's not true of everything in my trunk. Didn't he already say this in the article? For example, there's a very long unpublished novel that is pretty bad, but if I thought the Bachmans were bad books, or if I was publishing out of a sense of vanity, then I wouldn't allow them to go under any circumstances. 20 years later. I know the dome. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's what he's talking about. <laughs> I never felt any urge to let Bachman be anything but Bachman, King says. He had kept careful control to make sure the publisher wouldn't go wild promoting the book if Bachman's true identity came out. Thinner will go on selling as Richard Bachman, says King. I would love to see Thinner sold aggressively because I'd want that for Dick's last book. Thinner marked a change in King's attitude towards his alter ego. No longer was Bachman the repository for unpublished early works, books that didn't fit well into King's career. He had secret... Had the secret remained hidden, there were plans for the New Hampshire chicken farmer. There's a book that I thought would become the next Bachman novel, says King. It's a novel called Misery, and it's got that Bachman feel to it. So I thought, let's say that Bachman sells 30,000 copies of Thinner in hardcover. Hardcover. Let's say that it doesn't become a bestseller, but it does pretty, pretty well. If I could come back with another hardcover, I think I could have made this guy a bestseller in two or three years, completely on his own. Then a lot of people would have complained, saying, hell, he writes just like Stephen King. He must just be another imitator. imitator. The literary guild took thinner, and I heard a comment from one of the readers that this is what Stephen King would write if Stephen King could really <laughs> write. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Of course, King has several other projects in the work. His 600-page-plus short story collection, Skeleton True, will be published by in June by Putnam. There will be an original movie, Cat's Eye, which is expected to be on the which screen soon. Which is to be on the uh, screen blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Yeah, do you need to take a break? Well, it's really difficult to, to read. Yes, I do. It's a long... A it's long a long-ass article. Yeah. <laughs> you good? Yes. This fall, there is scheduled to be another movie, Silver Bullet. This is a year in the life of a werewolf told in 12 small pieces, each set during a different full moon. It is based on Cycle of the Werewolf, a novella published in 1983 by Land of Enchantment Press and a profusely illustrated limited edition. By the late, uh, Thony... What's his name? Yeah, I know who you're talking about, but I don't know what his name is. Weinstein? The guy... I don't know. NAL will soon be bringing out a trade pub- paperback edition. Okay. Well, I'm, that's been released by now. Yeah, I'm sure so. <laughs> One of the Otter products under development is a stage musical of the version of Carrie. Did they ever come out oh with a God. stage musical of Carrie? <laughs> so I'm gonna laugh at you, laugh at you. <laughs> I hope so. I don't know. Uh, at the time, it said, he said, it's being done by Larry Cohen, who did the st- Carrie screenplay. Sometimes I think Larry's turning Carrie into his life's work. I don't know what it's going to be like. We just keep reviewing, renewing the option because, after all, there aren't that many people who want to make a musical out of Carrie. <laughs> yet. <What? laughs> oh, my God. Even Richard Bachman has film deals in the works. The Long Walk and The Running Man are both scheduled to become films. Now that, Bach, now that the Bachman story is coming out, the happiest people in the entertainment business are a little production group out in L.A. that optioned The Running Man a couple years ago. Their option was about to run out. It had just a few days left when they heard the rumors. They came to Kirby and said, we're going to lose the option, aren't we? Kirby called them up and extended their options as though it were still Richard Bachman they were playing with. It's an odd parallel with my own career. Carrie was turned into a film right away, and it was a lucky hit. It shortened the whole business of becoming a success and having my work come to people's attention. Now, the long walk was never made, but it is in development, I think. 
by the guy who made The Mist, Frank Dillabont. Really? I believe he's making that into a movie. He does well with Stephen King's work. Yeah, he's a he's a good dude. He is. He well, made what else did he make? He made a little Stephen King. Movie. He did. The, well, he did the Green Mile. Oh yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. Okay. One long-awaited project that doesn't look as if it will happen is the publication of the complete stand. Well, we know that's not true either. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid cat. <laughs> Several hundred pages were cut from the published version, the initial published version, and rumors of a restored edition have been circulating for years. He says it won't be coming out, which, again, we know is not true. <laughs> it shouldn't have come out. It should say the way it was. Oh, my goodness. Nearing completion is another book that long has been the source of rumor. It is the Bible-length manuscript titled It, or That in this case, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that is reportedly King's magnum opus. I don't know if I would call it his magnum opus. It's a huge ass book, though. Uh, maybe I think uh, it's close. Have you read it? I, I can't say I've read all of it. <laughs> <laughs> you can't. Why are you saying that? If I don't you know. haven't read it, <laughs> it may well prove to be the definitive horror novel. But as has always been the case with King's books, it is only a, is only structurally a horror novel. Oh my goodness! It 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 is about kids. King says. It's like a gigantic, mad overexposition of the body from different seasons. I have been working on the rewrite, and I am surrounded by this huge manuscript. It has obsessed me for years. There are times when I think I ought to just burn it, but it is going to be a pretty good. You'll like it. It will be easy to say that Richard Bachman was simply a vehicle for King to move his earliest work out of the trunk. To a certain extent, that is true. Although he speaks of a Bachman feel to a novel... King does not acknowledge Bachman as a separate persona. I only wrote one of those books thinner with Bachman in mind, King says. It was never a case like Donald Westlake used to say as he wrote a Westlake on sunny days and as Richard Stark on days when it rained. But that chicken farmer with a ruined face has written four novels that are unlike King's own work. They are novels of simple stress without the artificially high drama of the supernatural. Stephen King in a minor key. All of the Bachman books are sad books, says King. They all have downbeat endings. I don't think the ending of a novel is particularly important, though a lot of people do. <laughs> I'm more interested in how people react along the way. As far as we're concerned, we're all going to come to an unhappy ending. They didn't fit into his career very well, says Kirby McCauley. He was known for his supernatural horror novels, and his fear was that he would lead his audience astray. Stephen King thought of Cujo as more of a Bachman book. There was nothing supernatural about it, and it certainly had a downbeat ending. Thinner, retrospectively, should have been a Stephen King novel. Viewed against the background of King's more famous work, the Bachman novels seem thin and unpolished, with the exception of Roadwork, a fine, thoughtful novel, novel by any standard. Yet they all have that classic Stephen King quality about them, the page-flipping narrative drive the inability to tell a boring story, readers love it. I don't know why that is, muses King. Sometimes I read the stuff aloud, and it's not there. Whatever it is that people like, it's not there to me. It's there when I write it, but it's not there when I pick it up. I've read in reviews for years that I don't have any style. With my kind of prose, I could be starving. And that's the end of it. Holy oh, shit. That, that was, was a long-ass long article. I don't know. I mean, I like Bachman books. People kind of being too negative. The Lawn mm -hmm. Walk is awesome. I can't say I've read any of them, so I can't. I can't comment. You can't comment. I cannot. We're gonna have to do all these books one day. I well, I look forward to reading them. I just yeah. haven't yet. Like I know the the Renny Man. He wrote that in a week. Really. Yeah, he was on a Christmas vacation or something from school because he was teaching at the time. Mm -hmm. He thought, well, what the hell, I'll write a novel. He just wrote the whole thing. And oh, I haven't read that one, though. I've read uh, Rage. I've read The Lawn Walk. I've read uh, The Regulators, always a fun book. And mm -hmm. I've read Blaze. So, yeah, we'll have to do episodes on those sometime. I mean, eventually... Eventually, the idea is to get everything. Yeah, everything will be covered at one point. In unless time. we die. Oh, I forget how to plug in the microphone again. <laughs> <laughs> and I kill him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See how that works? Um, but yeah, that was um, the original article that outed King. 
Very exciting. Do you think anyone was surprised? Probably. I'm sure there was a bunch of people who were surprised. Like, uh, gasp! Right. Rachel Bachman, Stephen King. What? what? I don't know. Crazy. Do you think it made like the nine o'clock news? Um, probably back then. That probably. was the only way you got news back yeah. then. It was either reading a paper or watching it on TV. Yeah, I know. All right. Well, I guess we should move on to um new news. New news? News from 2017, not 85. It's a bit of a time difference there. So let's go ahead and do the cool robot noise, okay. the robot transition, and then we will be back in just a moment to talk about news. News. All the news you can lose. Snooze too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so news time. We don't have many. We don't have anything to talk about PMMP wise. Um, Dark Moon Digest is oh. close to being finished. PMMP being Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing, the small press we own. Correct. We, I feel like we have to mention that because how do we know they know that? So they should listening. just know. They should automatically just know. Do you know that? Do you people? Do you? You should let us know. Hmm. But yeah, the small press we own. We have um, news, do we? No, uh, like I say, the magazine, the quarterly magazine we have, Dark Moon Digest. Yeah. Issue twenty eight will be out relatively soon. It's in the final stages of polishing up. Who, who's in that? Um, we will have a Patreon post within the next day or two. Oh, uh, we are. I already posted that on Patreon weeks oh, did ago. You? Yeah. Oh well, then. Yeah, go subscribe to go pledge to Patreon, and then you can see the post I made with the TOC. Fine. Yeah. Maybe today I'll post the front cover too. That's cover. Front cover is pretty sweet looking. If you pledge three bucks a month a month, you can see that. Very cool. And if you pledge just a buck a month, you can subscribe to the fucking magazine. Which is really awesome. Yeah. Which is not as awesome as Stephen King, Richard Bachman's Getting It On. <laughs> Bachman. Man, that was called Getting It On. It was about a kid who just school shoots people. That's I know, well, fucked that's, up. That's a really screwed up title, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. Um, so news-wise, with um, old Stevie King, we have a new casting for the Castle Rock Hulu series, which we will both feel excited about. I can't wait. So who's the new cast? Um... The guy that used to play in Hemlock Grove, Bill Skarsgård, has been cast as a series regular. He will be playing um, a young man with an unusual legal problem. I see. Now, this man, as you probably know, is going to be the new Pennywise in It. Is he? Is that yeah, who that's Pennywise him. Is? Very exciting. Well, he looks different. He doesn't have any makeup on. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I say but like, yeah a lot. Um, yeah. 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 But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. I'm kind of surprised that he's not going to be playing Pennywise. Right. Unless for some fucking crazy reason they get they're able to transition a man with unusual legal problems into a, a, a supernatural fucking clown. evil manifestation of everything anyone's ever been afraid of. Very cool. Um, if anybody could do it. They could. Well, yeah. They're the ones allowed to make the show. Oh, that's just true. <laughs> that's not what I meant. Isn't it, though? No, not really. Isn't it? No, it's not. The phone's ringing. No, it's not. It's a plane going overhead. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. Um, also, speaking of Pennywise, speaking of It, we have some new screenshots from the movie revealed by Entertainment Weekly. It's very cool. I mean, full photographs, so I mean, it's kind right, of difficult to describe. Art. We have kids looking at Sewolds with flashlights. Kind of looks like the Goonies. It kind of does, but... I mean, we're looking at a photo of the whole cast of the Loozles Club right now. They they look like kids. Crazy enough. That one kid was um, in Stranger Things. I don't recognize anyone else. No. He, him, he was um the kid who got kidnapped. Yeah, well, that one I recognize. So I'm yeah. not talking about that. <clears throat> okay, then. Yeah. So go look for them, because they're kind of cool. 
Gotta just Google it. Google lot. Uh, Google Pennywise's lair. Travel to Seacock, Maine, and ask you <laughs> about it. <laughs> oh, uh, professional podcasting. Yes. Another Stephen King news. AT&T is making a series out of Mr. Mercedes. I didn't know AT&T was in the television business, but now I know. Now Why not? You, now you know. But it it's, looks really good. Yeah, they announced, they revealed the the preview, the the trailer. The trailer. Yeah, it has um fucking what's his face? Brendan Gleeson. He's he's cool. He's really good. And then Harry Treadaway from Penny Dreadful is also in it. That's him. who it was. He, he played, played Frankenstein. Um, Frankenstein, yeah. Yeah. I thought he looked familial. But yeah, the, the trailer looks kind of okay. Yeah. It's, I mean, I haven't it's read the different books. different than, I mean, it's definitely not like the supernatural horror that we've been talking well, about, but it looks good. Well, I mean, the books have nothing supernatural in them. I don't, I don't know. I've never read Mr. Mercedes, neither, so neither I... Neither have I, but yeah, I know that. Isn't that strange? Yeah, why do you know that? Because I do my research. Oh, bullshit. That's why. Those three books. I guess I, that I knew. All crime fiction. But anyway, it looks really good. I don't know where our, we could find a, where AT&T is going to release it on. I don't but... know. Pirate it. I don't... Who that, gives a shit? I'm not talking about for us. I'm just saying in oh. general. <laughs> yeah. Everybody, just pirate it. No one gives a shit. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> no, I don't know. Just look it up. Look it up online. Good lord. I'm sure you can find that info. <laughs> you haven't read the books, and neither will I, but what I know about the books is it's a retired detective who's, like, going after the one who got away. Gotcha. Who is this guy. He just drove a Mercedes through a crowd of people one day. And some type of cat and mouse type of scenario that all detective books have. Cat and mouse is about Steve Brown. <laughs> 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 but yeah, it comes out August 9th. Is that what it said? Yes. Shit, man. This is a year of Stephen King. It really has been. It begins with the birth of this podcast, Seacock Radio. <laughs> <laughs> the announcement of Castle Rock, the series. We have The Dark Tower becoming a movie. We have It. We have The Mist, which we will eventually get to. And now, now we have Mr. Mercedes. Yeah. And then if Plessy has a new book coming out this year with Owen King. Yeah. He had two books come out this year. Yeah. Well, I don't know. If Let's I, not talk about the... <laughs> Let's not talk about the other one that came yeah. out this year because I don't think that counts. <laughs> <laughs> it, it didn't really come out. It was like it was like when like the the woman dies before she can get built and the dark soldier just has to pull out the dead fetus. Yeah. That like, was, that's what that, that was, is. That a dead that fetus. Yeah. Fetus deletus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Um, there's also a nettle trailer that was um revealed of the dark tower but movie dark tower <laughs> yeah it's a movie built a second yes. trailer so yeah we we just watched it um yes. what, what do you think about the, this I new think trailer if it weren't touted as like made off the stephen king books it might be an okay movie. You mean if it was just something separate. That, right, right. That was called something else. Right. I mean, it looks like it might be a decent movie, but I don't know. I hate that stop animation slow-mo crap. It looks like it belongs into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Yeah. It looks like Lord of the Rings spinoff. I don't know. I mean, not much else is really shown. We see more scenes in this trailer of them on um, in Jake's universe and Earth. Right. And... You haven't read past book one. But, Not yet. But Jake, he, Jake dies in the gunslinger. Right, he I, comes back in the second I, book. I knew that. But only... S it's been so long since I've read all seven books. But I think only some sections of book two take place on Earth. And the rest of them take place in Roland's universe, in Midworld. Right. But it looks like in this movie, most of it is going to be taking place in like New York City. And that's possible. I don't know. I mean, but it also it looks like Jake is the prota protagonist, and Jake is the reason why Roland is trying to defeat the Man in Black. But, but like that's not the way it goes. Right. Roland doesn't need convincing. Roland is already determined. 
but from the previews of this movie, it looks like it's completely back assed. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure we'll go see it because because we have a podcast. Well, we not have to, to mention we'll probably just go see it anyway. Yeah, but... we have to talk about it on Seacock Radio. <laughs> 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 But yeah, I, I don't know. Jake looks just so fucking stupid. I don't I don't want to watch a movie about this kid. No, I mean, Matthew McConaughey <sighs> looks like he's... They all look like assholes. Yeah. Well, he always looks like an asshole. Matthew but... McConaughey looks too clean. Yeah. Well, how come everyone has clean clothes on in this movie? <laughs> <laughs> Who's washing these clothes? <laughs> Who's shaving their beards? <laughs> it looks like it keeps showing like scenes of Roland and... um. Whoever Matthew McConaughey's name is in this movie is not Randall Flagg. No, it's I think Mad it's Walter. And um, all the scenes are like, "Aha, I've got you now, Man in Black." And the right. Man in Black is like, "Come get me, Roland." And then they battle right, like it's a one. Matrix movie. Exactly. God I don't know. damn it! It'll be okay. It's gonna be a bad movie, and it pisses me <laughs> off. It upsets well, me. It just, I don't know. I got it's the, not what I want. Yeah. Well, it's not what I imagine the Dark Terror series to be. I understand those worst things to be upset about. <laughs> Damn it, right now that's what you're I've upset been about. I've thinking about this as a movie for the last 15 year olds, and you know what? It's not what I imagined. So, so I'm gonna... tell the audience what my son said about the Dark Tower trailer. <laughs> oh, yeah. We, we were watching the Spiral Man Homecoming yesterday, I think it was. At the draft house. It's a pretty good movie, but in the, in the previews, they showed this um, DT trailer. And afterward, Dylan goes, he was 10 years old, he goes, What was that? Is that the new Star Wars movie? So he'll probably like it. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, like, it has that feel to yeah. it. Like it's some big fantasy blockbuster. It yeah. has a lot of action. I don't know. It's upsetting to you <sighs> it's really upsetting um i believe that's all the stephen king news is that am i correct i believe so however before we go we do have some more things to uh discuss in our newsletter we <clears throat> we uh put out an open call for anyone subscribed to us to write back about the gateway stephen king book that influenced them the the Phil Stephen King book they read that made them realize, oh shit, I'm gonna read this dude for the rest of my life. It's a question we always ask a guest when they when we have them on. But I thought it'd be interesting just to get some newsletter responses to see what what they had to say. So we're gonna read some of them out loud. All right. So uh, Ken says, my gateway Stephen King book for me was Night Shift. I read it young and I was hit for life. I finally got to see him live last year on Dayton, Ohio, because I have amazing friends. Hmm. I wish you would talk more about the experience you had seeing Stephen King live. So if you're listening to this, Ken. We'd like to hear more. Yeah, it'd be awesome. I wish you would come to Texas. It would be nice. I would kidnap him. He did come to Texas, but I think it was in Dallas, wasn't it? Ah, uh, maybe. Maybe in Austin, but I know it was like you had to like register and pay and... Man. It was like a pain in the ass, I think. Yeah. And there was a limited amount of seats. and. I don't think he does many uh, public signings. Probably not. If you're as famous as Stephen King, do you really need to do public I don't, signings? Well, I don't think he gives a shit about that. I don't think he likes like the public too much. I Well, you know. I know he's doing some signings with um, his son, but last I checked, nothing close to us. Well, they don't live near here, so... Okay. It's not surprising. Next up, we have... Go ahead. Take it away. All right. This is Eric, and his gateway Stephen King book was Pet Cemetery. He writes, I spent a lot of summers as a child in my grandma's care, both to save on sitter money and because she just loved having me around all the time, I'm sure. She knew I was really into Goosebumps books in fourth grade, and so when I asked for her to buy Pet Cemetery at the used bookstore, she didn't bat an eye. I'm sure she'd heard of Stephen King, maybe even knew he wasn't for kids, but figured she would have a problem pleading she wouldn't have a problem pleading ignorance if my mom found out. I had neighbor kids who always talked King up a big game, so I expected the worst. The story itself was pretty tame, even mildly funny to start, until I got to the first description of Pax Cow 
It was the first and one of the few times that I had one of those shouldn't have read this before bed moments. The ram's head in the forest was another one of those. So yeah, he got me with two of the maybe four times that's ever happened to me all in one book. Nice. And also we, holy shit. <laughs> okay, jo- Joanna has quite a long one. So let's get into it. Well, Gateway SK book. <clears throat> Seminole of 1980 in Mobile, Alabama. I'm on the back stoop reading in the sun. Cats come and go, lounging on the concrete. I lounge because I can barely move. I've got another bout of tonsillitis. My mom buys books for me at the grocery store checkout since I don't feel well. She likes the idea of pool, but she's too superstitious superstitious to read anything that skittles all. She's also too broke to follow medical advice and get the tonsils out. Maybe she believes the church when it says sickness is the result of demonic attack. After all, I'm the kid that gives her the most trouble. <laughs> <laughs> she should probably get reported to the CPS, but no one teaches a class on how to be a good parent. She does the best she can and brings home her little novels for me to read. Today, she brings home The Stand. Awesome. Immediately, I like the front cover. I think of myself as an artist, even though I don't know the name. Hieronymus Bosch. All right, neither did I. <laughs> but I don't think of myself as an artist. <laughs> the graphic looks medieval, mythologi- mythological, and I'm hungry for mythology. I'm hungry for the real view less humid and stifling than Semmel in 1980 in a town where teenage girls achieve the height of prestige by donning antebellum hoop sculpts to reenact the corseted past as... Azalea Trail Maids. Yeah, I don't know what the hell she's talking about. It's like about. a cotillion <laughs> thing in Alabama where you get dressed up in like those... Civil War hoop skirt things. Oh, okay, I gotcha. Hmm. I'm trying to redefine the future wheel in combat boots. <laughs> the, the irony of my illness isn't lost on me as I read. I feel a sort of twisted joy in the vivid color and milky texture of each clump I hawk up from my swollen throat. Tilting my head compresses my enlarged nymph... 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 Lymph nodes. Lymph nodes. I can't talk. Well, lymph nodes is like one of those words. To produce my excruciating and satisfying pain, which, of course, I reproduce over and over. The story itself engages me completely. In the battle world, I may have become a biologist, pathologist, or virus handle in a distant jungle. Stephen traces the emergence of the plague with perfect timing, so, so terrible and yet so thrilling. Hasn't every teenager wished there weren't so many people in the world? I mean, if all those people weren't around, you could do whatever you wanted, right? Skateboard in the middle of the street, eat pizza every night. I do that anyway. <laughs> Stay out for level. I do that as well, but not by choice. The breakdown of society was music to the savage beast of my anarchist soul. What is the fuck? <laughs> Just say the stand. <laughs> I reread the stand. I read read the, the stand last year, and I still love the first third of it. The Jersey Tunnel scene is still as good as I remembered from the concrete stoop. That was a good scene. Have you read the stand? I, I haven't. Um, have you read any Stephen King yes, books? Yes, I have. I know. It's I've read all this weird off the wall shit. Oh man. Okay. But I've been avoiding King lately. I don't want to feel the disappointment that's been going around, metaphor intended, among young, long-term fans. I've outgrown King the way I've outgrown Anarchy. I don't love the book now, especially the second and third chunks. It's too long, too lost, too much wind and Christian- Christianity in the sales. Too much sexism and magic blackness and implied prejudice prejudice against anything out white out not white and straight enough but in 1980 as i bake with fever in the sun cough up my own trippy version of psychedelic green phlegm and dream of a world empty of imbeciles as my throat swells too big to swallow more than a sip of instant tea and every stray in the subdivision sidles up to smell its fill on my sweaty legs the stand is glorious that was a Thanks. very detailed version of The Stand. Thank you, Joanna. That was a detailed version of The Stand, as you yeah, just said. That was a very detailed answer. I don't know. I think he's still good, obviously. We have a fucking podcast Ooh, about him. Yeah. Keep giving him a go, Joanna. Maybe, you know, 
Maybe you'll find something that floats your boat. Yeah. Don't read the stand. Read something else. Give uh, Gwenny's button bots a chance. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, we have something else. You want it? Yeah. Okay. So Kelly says the first SK book she ever read was Night Shift. I was homesick from school, about nine years old or so, and looking for something to read. I was already of the fan of the horror supernatural genre and decided this had to be more interesting than any other Nancy Drew book. SK wasn't really a household name yet. I think Salem's Lot and The Shining had just been released. The first story I read was The Lawnmower Man. <laughs> ha ha. Still remember the daughter in the story creaking up the court of Kool-Aid to this day. I read the rest of the stories in random order and then moved on to SK's novels. I still love his short stories and credit him as one of my main writing influences. The lawnmower old man. <laughs> hey. Uh, how does she keep reading King after that one? <laughs> <laughs> hey, that was our oh, first story. What do you want? Mm? Yeah, that was it. So um, if you're listening at home in a vehicle, at a hotel, in the this- if you're in the sky, if you're in the graveyard, then other places you can listen to podcasts. I don't know. While working out? Cat museum. Do they have such a thing as a cat museum? <laughs> yeah, it's called Steve Brown's house. Oh, okay. Meow. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're listening and you have some cool thing to tell us about your gateway Stephen King book, or hey, if you've met Stephen King, you want to tell us what that was like? Well, if, I don't know. Anything. Anything. Stephen if you want to talk to us, if you want us to read it on the show, we'll just keep it private. You can email us at um, an address, which is castlerockcast at gmail.com. Yeah. So send us an email. And if you like the podcast, you can support us on Patreon. Which is www.patreon.com slash pmmpublishing. You can also visit our URL at www.castlerockcast.com, our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash castlerockradio, our Twitter, which is twitter.com slash castlerockcast, and of course we just gave you our email, which is castlerockcast at gmail.com. Yeah, so we'll see you next time. We don't seem to be keeping a... We're trying to do every other week, but with kids home for summer vacation, it's it's so possible. I mean, this is kind of a weekly show all of a sudden because we just did Gwenny's Button Bots last week. Was it last week? Yeah. Well, already. Maybe. No, No, it was. It was the trivia show. Yeah. Was that last week? I don't know. I've lost track. Time is a flat circle, (laughs) Joel. It's a flat circle something. (laughs) Anyway, with that said, goodbye.